Hey you, do you want to be woke? I know I do, I wake up every morning thinking I would really want to be woke. That's fantastic because I have a product that meets that exact need that you just articulated right then. It's a new book called The Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness and it teaches you how to be woke. My entire life I've asked myself, how are these kids these days getting so woke? And I know that there's got to be an instruction book out there, but there isn't there until isn't. now. Now there is. Because this book teaches you how to be woke so you won't get canceled, so Twitter mobs won't come after you and ruin your life. You get to know how to choose your pronouns, your gender. Buy this book so that you won't get canceled. You can order it today. What's up, Ethan? What's up, bro? Not too much, man. I'm just hanging out here at my table with these red Solo cups all over it. What are these? I don't know anything about this because I didn't go to college. Um, I went to a Bible college, so I don't know anything about these either. Hmm. But they're arranged in this triangle shape, and there's like some ping pong balls so there. So it's like, it represents the two trinities of mm. Christianity. Put a dollar in the heresy jar. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, there's only one trinity. <laughs> I and, think that's correct. But it does mean, <laughs> maybe it means that the trinity is so important you should think about it twice. That's not heresy. <laughs> so today we're talking to Michael J. Kruger, who yeah. is president and Samuel C. Patterson, professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Reformed Theological Seminary. <laughs> That's a lot of titles. That yeah, is, this guy. He's this got guy. a PhD and an MDiv, and he's a really smart guy, and he's the author of 11 books. 11 a lot of books. That is a lot, because they take like a year to write. Take a lot, it takes a lot of your life to write 11 books. Uh, most recently, he wrote Surviving Religion 101, Letters to a Christian Student on Keeping the Faith in College. Right. And that helps you keep the faith in college. Yeah, so maybe that's why we have these. Maybe that's why there's this pong, pong cups. style Some game. Some sort of pong game here. Maybe something fun. We might be playing with him later. Will happen. He also, he's really, uh, he knows a ton about uh, uh, canonization, why yeah. the books that are in the Bible are in there. We talked to him about that. And then also he has a book, The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. We run down those Ten Commandments and find out which one is the greatest of them all. But other than that silly stuff, we do more serious stuff too. Like, read quotes from The Simpsons and see if oh, you yeah. can guess which character said them. Yeah, we, the theological, theological quotes from The Simpsons. We get in deep into the theological, faith-based Simpsons quotes. If all of that sounds interesting to you, don't hit stop. Keep watching. Buckle your bee belts. Because here we go. Hello, Dr. Michael. Oh, hey. Hey, doctor. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hey, do you, do you make everybody call you doctor? You uh, get really no, upset but it seems people don't. are inclined to do it, but okay. I'd rather Mike is great. So oh, correct okay. them. <laughs> well, Doctor Mike Michael Kruger, uh, welcome to the Bible the Babylon Bee Podcast. I'm Ethan. This is Kyle. We already got that out of the way. Yeah, yeah we already. Did. I mean, speaking of getting things out of the way, we like to start with an icebreaker. This is just a way Great. to get to know you better. The real Michael Kruger, not the one that everybody knows. The theolo Let's theology, see. canonization, uh, you know, all that stuff. We want to dig under the tweed jackets and get to know the real Michael. The man under there. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you are a president and a professor of Reformed Theological Seminary. But imagine you got impeached and cast out from academia, or I don't know. Do they get if, impeached? Is impeached the right a, word for that? He's a president. I don't know. No, presidents so, get impeached. Oh, I see. You're going with the president thing. Okay, great. Fair yeah. enough. And then I don't, yeah, also don't know if academia is the word. Is it seminaria? How's that? Is this, well, it depends like what I'm being booted from. I mean, the academy is a broad sort of You're booted thing, from all but, education. All right, great. Now what do you do? What's your job? <laughs> oh, like what would I do instead? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I, well, you know, sort of in another life, I would love to be like a sort of go on the professional bass fishing circuit and uh, <laughs> okay. fish every every week. That would be great. Or if, if I had an ultimate dream, I'd love to coach premiership soccer and preferably Liverpool. So, wow. but I know I wouldn't be able to do that. Like a but Ted Lasso. you're asking for dreams. Yeah, dreams. Yeah, yeah well, dreams. <laughs> Best I fishing. love Ted Lasso. Mm -hmm. Ted Lasso is actually one of my favorite shows. So. Yeah, okay. Even season two? Especially season two. What? I thought it found its stride in season two, actually. I um, quit. I quit in season two. I got like... <laughs> did I got, you now? On the Christmas episode, I was like, I'm done. It's, 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 it lost it. It lost it for me. Did you make it you to the, 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 the romantic in? comedy episode where it all it spoofed romantic comedies? If you didn't I'm, get I'm there, not, I got to the that, that is Abandoned. one of the best moments of television I've seen in a long time. It was really well done. Maybe I'll try again. I don't know. I'm having a tough time. I loved season one so much. All right. Well, the ice has been broken. <laughs> well, if you're talking about Ted Lasso, it's, you're, you're melted. So. Melted. That's true. <laughs> I, cry, I did cry when I watched it. season one. 
Well, we've really gotten Michael to uh, let his hair down. He has. And uh, we've gotten to know the real Michael bass fishing, soccer, coaching, Ted Lasso watching, all the important things. So you have a book called The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. Yes, I do. Yeah. Came out a couple years ago, 2019, I believe. Mm -hmm. Do you like it? Well, I yeah, if I wrote it, I hope <laughs> I uh, I approve this message by writing it. Yes. I'm sorry, that um, was a stupid question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I hope it's a helpful little book. It's not a big one, as you know. It's it's small and hopefully accessible to people, and um, and sort of a uh, a little bit of a, a riff off of Machen's uh, Christianity and Liberalism. Well, I know you've got your newer book that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, Letters to a Christian Student on Keeping the Faith in College. Yeah, do you surviving think, religion 101. Do you think people are looking at this right now wondering why there are cups everywhere? We're going to we're going to get to we'll that. Explain I asked that cups? very question when I came on. Yeah, I was like, oh, why are there all these the red cups? cups? Yeah. yeah, they can see the cups. Can see. Don't worry about the cups. The cups are coming in coming. shortly when we talk about his book Surviving Religion 101. But first, about let's going to college. Let's rewind to 2019 to the 10 commandments of progressive Christianity. And let's run down these and if you want to give us a little uh, elevator pitch or whatever for each one. Breakdown. Um, explain what you're talking about and defend it. Jesus is a model for living more. Blah, blah. Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. This is a commandment of. Oh, so this is what the progressives think. This is what they think. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So step one, as you read these, the listener needs to know these are not my gotcha. uh, ten commandments. These <laughs> are defend that idea, yeah. Doctor Michael. The, these are the ten commandments of progressive Christians. <laughs> would they? And admit, so I look at each one critically. Would yeah. they admit this? Yeah. Is this like more of an underlying assumption that they have, or they wouldn't say this, right? No, this is exact quote. So if uh, the, the book is based off, uh, or my book is based off a book by a guy named Philip Gulley. He wrote a book, If the Church Was Christian, and he hmm. has 10 chapters in that book. And my 10 commandments are the exact wording of each of his chapters. Oh, oh so, okay. And he, oh, I was completely he's wrong. He's been followed by Richard Rohr, who you might know is a well-known sort of spiritualist, hmm. uh, so to speak, who uh, also uh, sort of parrots the same 10 commandments back with slightly different wording. So yeah, these are their words. Okay. And actually, uh, the reason I, I, I felt like I could list it this way is because, you know, it's not a caricature. It's actually what they, what they believe. Hmm. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about that first one. Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. Yeah. So this is number one for a reason when it comes to progressive Christianity. And that's sort of a euphemism for liberal Christianity, depending on how you want to take that. This is the number one thing is to first deny Jesus's distinctive divinity. So you don't really worship him as God, and then you're left with just him as a good moral teacher. So what do you do with Jesus? Well, you follow what he says, and you try to be a good person. So the first ten of the Ten Commandments is basically just another way to say that you're, you, you believe in moralism. The mm-hmm. whole idea of religion is just to be a good person. It doesn't really have to do with worship or salvation. It has to be with being better, um, and that, that's the essence. So the, the first step in all progressive Christianity is to, is to deny the divinity of Jesus and go from there. It's a bad start. Not good. Let's keep going though. Affirming people's atonement. No, this is part. This is number two. Affirming people's potential is more important than reminding them of their brokenness. Yeah. So step two in your move towards progressive Christianity, if step one was deny deny the divinity of Jesus, step two is, is deny the uh, sinfulness of humanity. So you go after the idea that people are born sinful or that are innately sinful, and you replace it with the idea that people are innately good. And so that whole chapter is about that particular misconception, which is this idea that, wow, we should stop talking about people's sin. We should talk t- stop talking about how sinful people are. Mm. Instead, we should just sort of affirm what's great and good in them. Um, and I try to find a balance in my response. There, there is real dignity to humanity. They are distinctive um, and have amazing potential as God's image bearers. But you can't deny the fact that they're marred by the fall. And when you do that, you end up again with a liberal version of Christianity where there's no real sin problem here. That, 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 that people can save themselves just by being better. Hmm. Okay, and that's not true. Not true. Okay, got it. Number three, <laughs> the work. Yeah, none, just for the record, all 10 of these uh, are not true. <laughs> you're such, so a, just, you're such yeah. a convincing person. I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I'm number, on board. <laughs> number three, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. Yeah, so you Sounds can good. see where this goes. So, like, first, deny the divinity of Jesus. Second, don't, don't talk about people's sin. And then third, this is a corollary, is don't, don't, don't judge people. Mm. Don't be judgmental. And if you talk to any progressive Christian, this is Jesus one of the biggest that, complaints. Right? Isn't that a quote? Um, scripture. Yeah, Jesus said, don't judge lest you be judged. But of course, you have to understand, and I t- tackle this in the context, what, what it really means to not judge. And it doesn't mean you can never say when something's wrong. 
um, which is effectively what uh, is being argued by Goley, which is that you, you stop going around telling people they're wrong, even though that very statement is implying that people are wrong to go around telling people they're wrong. So right. there is a bit of an irony there, of course, in the in that approach is they want it, you know, they wag their finger at evangelical saying, stop being so judgmental, but you realize they're, they're doing the same thing. It's one exception. You know, well, actually, there's many exceptions I cover in the book of the no. sort of say one thing and do another. Hmm. So. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, number four, gracious behavior is more important than right belief. Yeah. So number four is sort of a salvo against theology. So what that uh, progressive commandment teaches is that the real problem in the church today is they care too much about theology. They care too much about doctrine. Mm. If you care too much about theology and doctrine, that just makes you a Pharisee. So stop caring so much about theology. Theology is the problem, not the solution. And we need to get back to just doing the right thing. What matters is what you do, not what you, what, not what you believe. Um, and if you're going to be a progressive Christian, that would be you know, straight down the center of the fairway. Actions matter more than, than, uh, than teachings. Hmm. That sounds like a teaching to me. <laughs> See, you're, you're, you're on it. See, you're already doing it, which is, you know, pointing out the sort of inconsistencies there with it. And I, I try to Got do that throughout him. my book. Thank you. Number, Number five, five, inviting questions is more valuable than supplying answers. <laughs> yeah. So this is a common sentiment in progressive Christianity, which is, you know, rhetoric along the lines of, well, you know, the journey is more important than the destination. What matters is not answers, but questions. And the real problem with Christianity today is it has too many answers. Um, it's just too certain. Mm. Um, and so this whole progressive commandment is basically going after the idea that you can know anything for sure and going after the idea of certainty. And so it's sort of a, uh, you know, chiding Christians for being too certain about what they believe and that if you really want to be a good religious person, then, you know, uncertainty uh, is is um, the better way to go. Now, I will say there's a there's a there's a nugget of truth there. Um, depending on what doctrines Christian holds, sometimes doctrine Christians are too dogmatic about things that are less certain. But I make the point that when it comes to the core truths of the faith, um, that we have good grounds for being sure uh, of what we believe. Well, it strikes me about all these so far is that there is, like you said, kind of this negative truth. But then they just kind of go to this extreme reactionary position of like, oh, theology is bad <laughs> because some people react. Some people are too far towards the truth side and don't do the grace thing, you know. And it, it, it strikes me that, um, especially with that one, too, that like, yeah, there's there's probably a place for questioning and, and there's a place to talk about doubts and, and, and all that. But uh, but when that kind of becomes your baseline, then you've got an issue. Absolutely. In fact, I say this in the introduction, and uh, what I say in the introduction of the book is that these are all half-truths, mm -hmm. so there, there is definitely an element of truth to each of them that we want to acknowledge, and that's actually what makes them so persuasive to people. You know, if they were completely false, right. um, then people would just identify them immediately as, as problematic, but I think the fact that there's an element of truth in there makes it trickier, right? Um, and so we want to be sure to acknowledge that, look, you, there's their doubts are, I cover this in my book, Surviving Religion 101, that people doubt it's okay to struggle. You want to be a church that can deal with hard questions. But at the same time, the idea that, that doubt is the goal or that, or that, that certainty is the, is, is, the, is the real problem, I think we would we'd want to push back on that. Number six, kind of similar-ish. Encouraging the personal search is more important than group uniformity. Yeah, so what's interesting about each of these t commandments is when you read the title, you're, you're thinking to yourself, what are they? What is it exactly they're talking about there? And, you, and yeah. obviously you have to read the chapter to know fully, but this, this particular one is <clears throat> group uniformity is, is something they say that churches should not go for. And they, they basically complain here about churches enforcing their own beliefs mm -hmm. or what we might call a theological parlance, something like church discipline, that if someone in your church loses their way morally or loses their way doctrinally and churches actually care about that and do something about that, that that's just, inform that's just conforming people to group think. And so they say, hey, you shouldn't do that. Um, you shouldn't kick people out of the church. Um, what doesn't, you know, that just basically is putting an institution over people. Um, and again, there's a little bit of truth to that, right? You have to be careful that you're not just defending an institution. But at the same time, it seems to me that the church has a right to sort of say, hey, it does matter how you live. And it does matter, um, of course, what you believe. It seems like some of these are based on false uh versions of the, what the church is like there's nobody that i know that's saying like we need to be this uh, completely uniform 
you know, almost like this militaristic, you know, yeah. it's more of a caricature that gets it's like a rebellion around. against the caricature of, yeah. <laughs> of what. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think there's some caricatures here. <laughs> and I think what happens a lot with people who are in the progressive Christianity camp is they've actually had really bad church experiences, um, probably in their, many of them in their past. And, and in their particular church experience, things might have been genuinely bad. Mm-hmm. Um, there may have been in an authoritarian church. They may have been in an abusive church. They may have been in a church that didn't allow for doubt or conversation. That, that, those churches are really out there. Sure. And, yeah. and part of what we need to do as, as Christians is just acknowledge, hey, there's an element of truth to what you experience. There are some churches like that, and we would be very concerned about that. I think on the flip side, though, that, that doesn't define Christianity, mm-hmm. um, and it doesn't define all churches, nor should it be used as a reason to sort of you know, remake Christianity completely over into a, into a progressive uh, image uh number seven meeting actual needs is more important than maintaining institutions yeah so uh this particular chapter is saying hey the church has a lot of problems you shouldn't just be protecting the institution you should be out there helping people um and meeting people's needs and this chapter seven and eight are probably the two chapters where i think the book gets closest to truth if mm-hmm. you want to say it that way. Mm-hmm. And I think there's some, there's some real truth here in, in seven and eight, which is the church does have problems. Um, you don't want to be just sort of defending an institution, defend an institution. And we really do want to be care, careful to help people and, and meet people's needs. I think the, the, the problem is here is that it's, a, it's presented as one or the other mm-hmm. um, in sort of a, a false dichotomy again, which is, well, well, why can't the church be the agent that God uses to help meet those needs rather than pushing that aside and, and, and meeting those needs in some separate way? So, you know, I think you can see the theme emerging here, which is that there's, there's false dichotomies, there's caricatures, there's absolutizing something that shouldn't be absolutized. Number eight, peacemaking is more important than power. Oh, I think I took the next one. Sorry, pal. No, I, I think we're right. Oh. You're evens. I'm odds. Eight is even. Yeah, so oh. chapter eight, right. and I say this in my book, chapter eight has, is a good chapter uh, in many ways that, that, that Goley wrote. And he, he's pushing back here against authoritarianism in the church. And honestly, I think he's, he, he, he makes some good points. The church, and I think we've seen this, honestly, in the last five to 10 years, there's some, there's some parts of evangelicalism that, that are high on uh, sort of an authoritarian model of ministry, sort of a, a top-down, heavy-handed model of ministry. We've, we've, we've read a lot about abuse in the church over the last few years, and, and Goley's like, hey, you know, that, those things aren't right. And I got to say, in chapter eight, I think he's, he's right. Those things are not right, and we need to acknowledge them. I think once again, there's a little bit of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, though. The, the solution isn't sort of therefore reject church authority, but rather uh, find the right way that it, that it should be wielded. And I think when people have bad experience with church authority, they think the solution is we'll do away with church authority. The, the best solution is no authorities. And I would say, no, that the solution is the right authorities that behave rightly. And so, you know, it's kind of like the same with police. If you have an abusive police officer, some people say, well, get rid of police officers. Mm-hmm. Well, you can <laughs> see that doesn't work. Um, but, but what the solution is, is good police officers that wield their authority rightly. Um, and so same thing happens in the church. Church is abusive and authoritarian. And the answer is we'll get rid of church or get rid of authority in the church. And I'm like, Hey, I get that. I get the reaction there. Um, but it, but that's not helping. For sure. Number nine. Now this one's spicy. We should Mm -hmm. care more about love and less about sex. Cue the sex. Yeah. So, so (laughs) if seven and eight are his best chapters, or best commandments, goalies, nine and 10 may be the worst. Um, and uh, nine is where you start realizing where this is going. You can't ever have a version of progressive Christianity that doesn't eventually get to sexual issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and predictably, as nine suggests in the title there, the, the idea here is it's very sort of, sort of stereotypical. Look, we should be worried less about sex and more about love. Don't we want love in the world? And why is everyone such a, so persnickety about you know, you know, sexual boundaries, you know, lighten up. Um, you know, we just need to be encouraging people to love each other. Why does it matter who or how you love? Um, and on one level, you hear that and go, oh, that sounds kind of reasonable. I mean, maybe we should just stop worrying about boundaries and just love each other. But of course, we know that love requires a definition. Um, you got to define what you mean when you say love each other. And that God very much cares about the way, uh, you know, sexual behavior is among his people. And, and, and wrong sexual behavior can be really damaging. Uh, to people and to a culture. And so, um, again, there, there may be a, an element here of, of truth that we want to acknowledge, but eventually realize it's, it's headed down a path that, that Christians historically have not gone. Now, as a clarification, we have a lot of homeschoolers who listen to this podcast. Can you explain what sex is? <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe their parents. I, I, I challenge. I challenge the first statement. I don't know if you have a lot of homeschoolers <laughs> who listen to this podcast. That may be uh, part of the. Have a lot of people. You know, your sarcasm. I don't know, but yeah. uh, I was like, I heard that. I was like, is that true? <laughs> we do, I don't know we, who listens to your podcast. We have a decent, but, uh, decent number of homeschool. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. yeah I imagine know. like the guy that wrote this commandment. Like he got all the way to nine. I've been following him the whole time. Like, okay, all right, man. You really thought this through, and he finally gets that. He's like, so I should be able to sleep around with whoever I want. Oh, uh, I see why he did uh, all Now this. we okay. see where you're going. I yeah, you can it. see where it's right. um, building you, up to. It's like every time they, they found a cult, they're like, I heard yeah. from God. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. And they're like, and so all the women should we do orgies. sleep with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. And all the wives, you know, you yeah. just, all just wives. You know, rotate it's them out. It's funny how God gives the same message to all the cult leaders. You know, <laughs> <so> <laughs> <remarkable>. <laughs> it does always boil down to that. And finally, number 10. Life in this world is more important than the afterlife. Yeah, man. Yeah, Sounds I mean, good, just bro. let that one sink in. This is a this was actually a sad way to end the book. I was like, mm. oh my gosh. I mean, it's one thing to go for the I can now do whatever I want sexually move. We kind of that's kind of predictable. But, but the the tenth one is is just tragic, mm. which is he's actually telling people, don't worry about the afterlife, don't worry about eternity, just worry about the here and now. Mm. And I was like, oh man, I guess this is sadly the real payoff because Jesus literally said the opposite. Um, don't worry about who can kill the body and soul in the present, but who can mm-hmm. take that into eternity. So, you know, I, I can't imagine a chapter title, the more opposite than the Christian message. The Christian message is you do need to think eternally and you think about uh, eternal matters and not just about the here and now. And it's when you think about the here and now only and just are myopic about it, that you're uh, living, a, a, a you're, you're heading down a dangerous path. So, so yeah, that, that's a sad way to end the book. And I think it just shows you that progressive Christianity will take you some really hard places if you follow it. So you, so you become a progressive, progressive Christian and by the end, you're an atheist. <laughs> this is always the message. But yeah, I mean, it's practically so. I mean, you could still say you believe in God, but if you don't really care about eternal matters, it, it, practically you're living like as if God God doesn't exist. Well, anytime you watch like secular media or atheist media, this is always the message that they come out. Well, if there's no God, then what we do now is what yeah, matters. This is where, yeah. If nothing matters, then actually everything matters. Yeah. <laughs> I find meaning in... Creating my yeah, body. which of course is a rather ironic. You're like, well, if there's no God, then and eternity doesn't matter. But then if there's no God, then the present doesn't matter either. It's like, right. why would I care about saving the environment? Why would I care about doing any of the things that we're told we need to do if there, if, if, if there is no eternal significance to those things? So yeah, I, I've never gotten that argument, but I know it's Again, It just reinforces number nine, which is what they're going for. I maybe. think ultimately oh, yeah. we need to go back to number nine. Number nine is the ultimate. Yeah. There's just one <laughs> so, progressive commandment in the end. <laughs> great teacher. Which of these is the greatest command? Mint. Mint. <laughs> oh, you're asking me yeah, which, yeah. which of the 10 in progressive, progressive Bible, is, is number one? Well, progressive apostles are like teacher, the teacher. Yeah. They're learning at your feet. Which I is think, the greatest I think commandment? It's a, yeah, so I think it's a trickle-down effect. If, if number one is true for them, okay. and Jesus is not God, and he's just a good mm-hmm. moral teacher, then, then, then you just you realize you just pull that one thread and everything else follows from it. So because call, now you don't have to that moral really teacher. follow him. He's not, he's not God. He's not divine. Right. You don't have to worship him. You just have to try to be a good person. But of course, even if you try to be a good person, now you just define that yourself. Mm-hmm. What, what counts as good. Jesus doesn't get to define it for you. You get to define it yourself. So you can define good in whatever way you want. You can define sex in whatever way you want. So the, the ultimate move in progressive Christianity is towards autonomy. The move is I get to decide these things for myself. I make my own values. I make my own decisions. I make my own morality. And you get all that from the first one. So the first one mm-hmm. really is first for a reason. Are there really a lot of progressive Christians that just straight up deny the divinity of Christ? Because I, I, I seem to see more often that they, they push back against him being like exclusive, the exclusive way to God. Well, you, there's, there's a bunch of different iterations of it. You're sure. right. I mean, not, you know, progressive Christianity is a very vague term, isn't it? Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, there's people all over the continuum. Some, some would, Gully in his book, and I, I say this in my book, flat out denies the divinity of Jesus multiple times okay. very plainly. So he's one of those guys that's like, no, 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 he's not. He's not worthy of your worship. He's just a guy. He even denies his sinlessness. He's saying he's a sinner too. Um, and then you got some people who want to nuance it. Maybe Jesus was partly divine or so special as a prophet that he was kind of perfect, but maybe not God. And there's some middle ground there. Yes. Um, so it's not just one type of progressive Christianity that's out there. Okay. All right. Well, that's been a good discussion about the Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. And now we're going to play Theology Root Beer Pong. Root Beer Pong. So you wrote a book called Surviving Religion 101, Letters to a Christian Student on Keeping the Faith in College. So we came up with this game that can help prepare kids to go to college. 
Which yeah. is thus root, the root beer part. Root beer, right? Pong. So they yeah, should try this exactly. game instead of that devil's pong that they yes. other college kids are playing these days. Yeah. All right. So what we're going to do is there's three categories of question. Uh, under each cup is a number. One of the questions will be a theology question. One category could be a deeply, deeply personal <laughs> question. <laughs> Spicy. And the third ones are questions about monkeys. So we'll see wow. What we get. Let's avoid the monkey questions, please. I don't know and, if I can uh, go there. So. And, so, and I'm terrible at beer pong because I'm so holy. I've never played it. I don't even root know the pong. rules, to be honest with and you. And technically, it's cream soda because we couldn't find <laughs> Why it. Why do I beer? believe not a, nothing you guys are saying right now? But okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have legitimately never played beer pong. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> All, right. All right, here we go. Here we go. Theology. First, uh, am I going first? Go for I it. I'm doing this publicly. Oh. Nice try. Oh, oh you have to bounce it? Well, if you bounce it, yeah, you bounce can it. hit it away. What? One bounce. I can hit it. No, that will take forever. Two. How does this guy know this? the rules to beer pong? Know, <laughs> Catholic man. They don't Catholic. corrective. <laughs> root beer pong. Drink all it. Root, root, root beer pong. Thank Sorry. you. That's all I. Have. No, I was asking him the uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. Oh, it's my guy. turn. Sorry. about the rules. Gosh. We're Presbyterians. Remember. <laughs> oh, that's true. This is gonna take forever. Come on. Come on. You got to get more uh, air. There on. we go. Hey. Finally. Boom. All right. Here we go. I got to drink. Oh, you got to drink it and then a question. Two. All right, deeply personal questions. <laughs> uh, tell us about your first kiss. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you guys weren't kidding. <laughs> Don't I get a pass or a phone a friend? <laughs> he could do another one. He could one pass, one. yeah, you could say do a... Yeah, I, that'll be for another day, another conversation. <laughs> if you right. want that answer, you're gonna have to play real, we real really pong, get, We gotta get you beer. drink, yeah, you gotta get you drinking more root beer. Uh, okay, fine, what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Oh wow! Um, They're all deeply personal. Wow, you those are t one. One was one was uh, lighthearted at least, and the other one was very serious. Um, <laughs> you can answer facetiously. You can be like, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Tetris. honestly, recently I've been staying awake at night just with, uh, you know, my I have a child who's a senior in high school, mm -hmm. heading off to college, and we're in the middle of praying and thinking about next steps in in his life, and um, so I've been actually up late at night thinking about. That whole process and what's what's coming for him and so forth. So I guess like any any father, sometimes you lay awake at night thinking about your kids. So I, right. I would imagine that I probably lose most of the sleep over them. That makes in sense. a good way because I love them. My turn. Yeah. You didn't know. I know. Do you want me to do it? Yeah, I get somebody sit in for me. <laughs> no, this makes it. One. Yeah, Patrick. Oh! Patrick, take over for me. You can't tag team. Yeah. It's, like, it's called a celebrity shot. Come on. Man. I figured you guys would have practiced. Come on now. No, we, we got go time for that. No elbows over. Oh, oh, almost. Oh, that like spun off the thing. Right, one more, one more. Oh, yes. Look at this spin. Oh, so you technically could take that That's out. That's crazy. All right. This guy's like Bill Nye Patrick's the Patrick's got guy. it. I can see it. It's a number three. So you're getting a question about monkeys. Uh. <laughs> we tried to put more theology ones. Than well, we're well, at least that them. fits with the, the, um. the Pong game. So Chimpanzees target the face, hands, and groin in an attack. <laughs> In an attack. With that in mind, the chimpanzee is coming at you. What do you do to defend yourself? Man, I would hope to curl up in a ball and put my head down so he can't uh, go for any of those orifices, I guess. That's so. probably a good... My theory is that they get the hands because people are using that to cover up the other two. As a Christian, you know God's always there for you, but sometimes things in this life can feel downright overwhelming, and you just need to talk to someone. That's right. That's why the online counselors at FaithfulCounseling.com are there for you. Connect with a professional Christian counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's yeah. so convenient. It is, and it's nice that you can uh, talk to someone who shares your faith and values, people that specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, crisis of faith issues. You're not going to get that with an atheist counselor. I'll tell you what. Right, and you just four communication modes, text, chat, phone, and video. You can start communication under 24 hours. Desktop, mobile, web, Android, man, they got everything. Uh, there's financial aid uh, available for those who qualify. It's affordable, faith-based. So check it out. You can go to faithfulcounseling.com slash Babylon B, and you'll get 10% off your first month at that URL. Yeah, why not get started today? Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash Babylon B. What was that again? Oh, that's right. It was faithfulcounseling.com slash Babylon B. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor that you're going to love. 10% off. Check it out. Check it. I knew this would be a unique podcast, but you guys are asking. All right, we got another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely. 
Or well, just... technically counts as two. You can do oh, two. No, another monkey question. <laughs> <laughs> another monkey question. We apologize, sir. All right. Uh, that counts as two. Counts as two. What counts as two? Bounce. Bouncing counts as two. Oh, okay. Uh, who what wins in a fight? Planet of the Apes versus Planet of the Bears. Oh, Planet of the Apes by a mile. Because Planet the Planet of the Apes, if you're going with the plot of the of the of the story, they're they're highly intelligent. Well, you almost at a human the bears level. Could be too. I mean, they're equal on the. Okay, so we're now going for super bears versus super chimp- right. chimpanzees. I'm still going with chimpanzees because they have they have the ability to build things with their hands and handle a gun, whereas a bear could never shoot a gun because it doesn't have any mm-hmm. sort of you know opposable thumbs kind of thing. So opposable thumbs is still sticking point. with the. Uh, okay, still but sticking with the chimpanzee. Just, uh, incorrect. Incorrect. Oh, there's actually a correct answer to that question. Okay. Well, because they're apes, they're not monkeys. Fail. Oh, okay. Well, still, I'm still going with the apes <laughs> on that over um, the bears. So he said you have to t- take right, another two? one. Yeah, you just drink Does it have to be one. another? Oh, I, I take bounce, another one. Because I bounced okay. it. Yeah. It's a theology question, finally. 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 Something like maybe have a little bit of hope of getting right. All right. What do you got against the Apocrypha? Is that really the question? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, it depends what you mean by have against. Uh, <laughs> the Apocrypha is a reference to intertestamental books that are in Roman Catholic Bibles that aren't in Protestant Bibles, and they're really technically Old Testament canon books. So like 1st, 2nd Maccabees, Judith, Tobit, etc. Mm-hmm. I have nothing against them. I think they're fascinating historically. I think they're useful. I think they are helpful uh, framing out the history of, of Israel post-Old Testament times, but I don't think they're scripture. Um, and that, of course, is a, is a reason that I'm a Protestant. Um, and the reason I don't think they're scripture is because I don't believe those are the books that Jesus and the apostles viewed as scripture. So in other right. words, when we look in the New Testament and books are cited from the Old Testament as scripture, you don't see a single instance ever, not even once, of a book from the Apocrypha cited as scripture. Yeah, I heard you on another podcast. I did do research. I heard oh, that answer. I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, they, they never yeah. cite those books at all throughout the whole New Testament. And, and also how much they cite the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. Oh, thousands another, and thousands of citations. Another yeah, theology. And I, ba- I bounced it, by the way. So. As a bounce. All right. How do we know we are reading the Bible correctly if sola skip scriptura is correct? I'm trying to understand the nature of the question. So, in other words, if you believe it. in sola scriptura, how then can you know if you're reading the Bible correctly if presumably the Bible is the only authority? Oh, so it's uh, like circular? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's the nature of what the question is trying Dan to get at. This question? Um, well, I think it or might be a misunderstanding of question. sola scriptura. Um, Sola Scriptura is often misunderstood to mean the Bible is the only authority. That's not what it means. It means the Bible is the ultimate or highest mm-hmm. authority, not the only authority. So one authority in the, in, the, in the life of the believer is the authority of the church legitimately and the history of the church and the, and the union of saints over, over history. It's just that those don't trump the Bible, but they are illuminating in terms of how to interpret the Bible and understand the Bible. Uh, so in that regard, you know, you can use all kinds of helps to interpret the Bible correctly, uh, even though the Bible itself is the highest court uh, for anything you believe. So, Sola Scriptura does not mean we have no basis for interpreting the Bible correctly. Okay. All right. So, I think yeah. I But what I love, by the way, is when I'm, when I'm halfway through my, my, my answer, the, <laughs> the ponging starts, starts again. Out. It's like you're at the Oscars, you know, and the music <laughs> cues up. Like, you need to stop talking now. The microphone no, it's great. It's lowers. Great. It's perfect. It's I, like, I know to stop I, talking I, if you guys are throwing okay, the But you're a college again. professor, so <laughs> you're used to this. Like, you're talking, you're giving your speech, and then all of a sudden... Yeah, you guys are like, we're done. Out. That's yeah. it. I start feel like we're at, a, we're at a college party, and this guy's right. talking yeah. about the Bible. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, cool, man. Blah, blah, blah. I know this is what goes. kids need to prepare themselves for is to have exactly right. you're, discussions. You're just living out my surviving religion while playing one, 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 root one, beer one. pong. Wait, hang on. Is the score six to one? I now? have two more. Cu- I just drank a cup and I get one more. So, okay. One. So six to one. Well, one more question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, six. Good. It's root beer. Yeah. <laughs> I had one that I wanted to ask. Is it in here? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, I'm just going to ask a random one. Oh, yeah. Why do we trust Paul when he says, I'm speaking the words of God? Uh, but not your neighbor, Charlie, who raises parrots. <laughs> well, for one, if he raises parrots, I already have my doubts about uh, Right? Charlie. Isn't that like a giveaway? But, um, that, like, there's something yeah, up with the guy? I don't know where He's the got, parrot, like, parrot on his in. shoulder. Immediately, a, you're like... I have a parrot. Yeah. So, I mean, this is... This gets <laughs> That's the, true. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> this gets to the fundamental nature of Revelation. So, obviously, the only person we can listen to ultimately to know what's true is God himself. The next question is, how does God speak? Well, God has chosen to speak 
through his official agents, which we call prophets generally in the Old Testament and apostles in the New. He doesn't speak through everybody. He doesn't speak through your neighbor, especially a neighbor that raises parrots. <laughs> um, and he doesn't even speak parrots. through you and I in that way. Um, you have to be a prophet or apostle and sanctioned to be God's mouthpiece. And how do you know who apostles and prophets are? Well, they have all kinds of authenticating signs, typically miracles and, and supernatural uh, wonders, which are true for both the apostles and the prophets. Um, and so obviously you can't go back uh, in time and witness all that, but we do have the record of scripture that gives us confidence that Paul was a genuine apostle and that we would listen to his words differently than you listen to your pastor or a uh, neighbor. Thus the plonging again at the very last of <laughs> Love it. I that think was a you, double bouncing in, right? I but think, I think I yeah. have one more. You're like, okay, you're done. All right, so one more from you, one more from me. Well, two more from me, really. And that'll Monkey be Monkey question. <laughs> uh... All right, this is kind of an analysis question. Why do, why do you think monkeys throw poop? Try to get in their head. Man. <laughs> you guys are hilarious with these questions. Um, well, I mean, it's probably their their version of, uh, you know, throwing shame on someone else, I'm guessing. Like, hey, I don't like you. Um, that's and their the best cancel, way to do that is to throw, throw feces on them. That's cancel culture monkeys. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, basically, you're, you're, you're done. You're dead to me. I'm throwing mm -hmm. feces on you. So uh, you're out of the out of the tribe. You got one now. There's a lot of um, there's quite a bit of cream soda in each one of these. <laughs> <laughs> I know didn't need to be that much. All right, so you got a double. So I got two cups that were both theology questions, okay. and that will end our uh, that will end our beer pong. Root beer wow, pong. Two theology questions. So you lucked out. By the way, I noticed the Freudian slip there to the beer pong. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, root beer. Don't, root don't beer. I didn't hear that. Um, it's apostrophe beer pong. Did Martin Luther want to kick the book of James out of the Bible? Okay, so Luther was very critical of James. We know this. Um, Luther, you know, had strident views on lots of things, some of which were certainly on the edge. And even looking back, some of those things we would probably be uncomfortable with. And he did critique the book of James as an epistle of straw, largely because it was, it was all ethics and law, and he thought it had no gospel in it. Um, now, we would disagree with James, or sorry, disagree with uh with uh, Luther on that. We think just having law doesn't mean you're against the gospel. It depends on the way you hold the law. If it's flowing out of grace, then it's, it's fine. If you use it as meritorious works righteousness, then obviously it wouldn't be. But James is not the latter. James understands that everything's rooted in, in faith. In fact, he does that in James 2. The works you do flow from, from faith. Now, just one side note, Luther backed off this later in his life and was not as stringent about James as he grew older. So, you know, he kind of mellowed a bit you might say in his later years okay and uh a lot of churches <laughs> <laughs> i made one are we still going count. i thought you wanted no, to do eight I total we were, uh, we're not going but i just want to see if i can make you it you guys are getting better <laughs> a lot of churches are focusing on racial reconciliation or social justice is this a good thing or is this something that churches are focusing on instead of the gospel sorry i've drunk a lot of cream soda <laughs> Yeah, so, well, look, I mean, I think we, we want to affirm, first of all, the Bible cares very much about uh, issues related to justice. It's in the Bible. It cares about racial harmony. That's also in the Bible. Uh, the gospel is for all nations, uh, irrespective of race or ethnicity, and that, and that God, and we see this in, in Revelation uh, 6 and beyond, which is in the new heavens and new earth, we're going to see people from every tribe, tongue, uh, uh, and nation there. And so, in as much as there conflict and, and strife between races, and, and honestly, you know, that's on a, we, we see that. That's all over the place in our history and still a problem today. So, yeah, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Does that mean that every particular attempt to solve it is healthy um, and that everything we see around to try to deal with the problem of reconciliation is, is, is the right way to go about it? Well, obviously, um, we'd want to try to solve it in the most biblically faithful way we can, and, and not every attempt to do that is necessarily going to be faithful to Scripture. Some will be better than others. Um, but I think the church is obligated to speak into injustice when they see it. Is that antithetical to preaching the Word? No, because when you preach the Word, part of the Word's message is God cares about these issues, um, and we just want to make sure that we're dealing with them in a biblical manner. All right. Well, good job, uh, bro. Thanks, can I ask you professor. the last monkey question, just because I'm curious? I like curious. bro thrown in there. Yeah, yeah well, monkey, monkey question. Pong, so, yeah. Would you ever eat a burrito made of barbecue pulled monkey? 
I am not inclined to eat monkey, just for the record. So um, it's barbecue pulled monkey. It's a really tender. No, I, I, I'd have to have some precedent to think that's good, and I don't even know how I'd get there. So there, there's probably countries that eat monkey. I don't know which ones they are. Probably so. sounds like it'd be really stringy to me. All right, uh, good job. I think it would taste bananas. Let's jump back in the seats. <laughs> Like for like 15 minutes, all I heard is voices from who knows where and well, ping pong balls flying around. This is a experimental show. Disembodied. Yes. Voices. Never know what this is. This get. is about what I expected on the Babylon Bee, <laughs> what, what, what I've just experienced there. Good. That's so. what we want. You guys should know you're meeting my expectations. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. So now for something more serious, because that was a little too goofy. We're going to go. Uh, we heard from uh, you know our buddy Adam reached out to you to kind of get some preliminary uh, information on you. We found out you're a big fan of The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Love The Simpsons. So we want to analyze um, some uh, faith-based quotes from The Simpsons. Oh, you want to talk about why you like The Simpsons so much? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to. I mean, I, I've, I've watched The Simpsons for a long time. Obviously, it's been running longest-running show in U.S. history, um, maybe television history for yeah. that matter. But, um, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm more of a, a seasons 5 to 15 guy. Um, I feel like, the you know, once you started crossing over to the 20-season mark, I, I, don't, I didn't find it as... Uh, compelling, mm -hmm. and I, th I think the the, the uh, sort of middle to earlier years were were I think the most uh, brilliant, and, and their satire was was phenomenally in uh, insightful and funny. Real but. quick, do you want to uh, explain to the homeschoolers listening what The Simpsons is? <laughs> <laughs> Simpsons started on the Tracy Allman show, which a lot of people yeah. forget um, was actually a short on the Tracy Allman show, and then spun off into its own series. Matt Groening being the main sort of uh, genius behind it. And I don't know, what are they up to now? 30, is something, it 30 years? 30 something, something like that. Crazy, yeah. Um, it's just the story of a, of a family of five called The Simpsons. That's a, obviously a cartoon. They're yellow. It's, uh, they're, they're yellow. They have four fingers in every hand. Um, and it's set in a Except for town. God. That's right. Set in a town called Springfield, which you never know what state it's in because they've kept that secret for, you know, 30 years, but they always tip you close to where they think it might be and then, pull out the camera at the last minute when you're going to find out. But um, <laughs> so it's just the life of this family in this town. And the father is kind of a they go to church. bumbling guy named Homer. And the mother is a saint named Marge. And they have three kids, Bart. Well, Lisa, if an age of, if you go by age, it would be uh, Bart, they, Lisa, and Maggie. And they can Wikipedia the rest at this point. I appreciate your very sincere yeah, attempt really to explain <laughs> to the homeschoolers. <laughs> well, you know, I want them to be part of culture too. Yeah, the teacher in your blood. All right. Okay, so this is going to be a kind of a test here because you are competing for something big. For uh, We're going to give you a quote. You tell us who you think said it. If you get it right, you get 10 seconds of free advertising on the Babylon Bee podcast. And what am I advertising? You whatever, work, whatever you book, want. Whatever I want? Yeah, yeah. book. Or, or whatever you want. Yeah, it could be okay. anything. If you sell um, But if you get it wrong, you lose 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> All right, far away. Us? Does he have to Never pay done us? Some some yeah, I don't want to get in the negative. <laughs> All right. We're going to cut this show short. All right, ready? Let's do it. I've done everything the Bible says, even the stuff that contradicts the other stuff. Um, that's got to be Ned Flanders. Nailed it. Ten seconds. Put it on the somebody who keeps put scoring. it on the scoreboard. What if we chose the wrong religion? Each week we just make God matter and matter. Well, that's a skeptic, um, which would probably be Homer. I'm going to guess with Homer. Are we doing an analysis on these at all, or are we going to just read them off? I want to see what he had says about contradictions. Oh, you want yeah. To I mean, I could. Ned you Flanders? want me to sort of? I, lo I love Ned. You can unpack. Can, you want me to unpack? Yeah, Ned's I'll unpack. Point. So, well, yeah. I mean, Ned is the quintessential evangelical on the show, right? Mm -hmm. Who's kind-hearted and, and and friendly to all around him, and really a remarkably honest character. Um, but then he has these moments of doubt that flash up throughout the whole series. Um, and the quote, if I remember correctly, was one of those where I think a lot of tragedies happen to him, and, he's, and he feels like the God's not. You know, doing the right thing to me because I've always followed him, even parts that contradict the other parts. And that's their jab. Mm -hmm. The Simpsons staff, I think, throwing in there, the Bible still is contradictory, even for those who think it's great. Um, but it was like a crisis of faith for, for uh, obviously, Ned. Yeah, you can tell there's like a contempt for his character from the writers, but then also a thing that happens in story writing is it's hard not to, you need a character that uh, that is morally motivated to do the right thing. And it's hard to, to, to just avoid that constantly. And I, I don't know. I can't get into their heads, but there's something fascinating to me there where like. It, it's funny. I, 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 they definitely make fun of that. 
Yeah. But I, I don't I, I wouldn't have used the term contempt. I think they 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 actually paint Ned incredibly with, with incredible integrity. They just sort of mock him as sort right. of silly and 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 just what religious people are. Right. And then Homer, who obviously is the sort of main character of the show, is shown to be sort of a deadbeat dad half the time and he's lazy and he's drunk and so they're, it's weird. Yeah. They're honest about their foibles, but they're they're but so they know Ned's a great guy in terms of his character, but he's just weird and strange, like all evangelicals are in the minds of. Can they make him like the devil at some point? I don't know. Not yeah, I'm one of the dreams. One of Homer's oh, dreams. Dream, yeah, Homer's dream. I guess to Ned Homer comes to him and trusts him. He probably you know, knows the exact Satan. episode number. Did he get the last one right? <clears throat> he did. He's got 20 seconds of free advertising. All right. All right. Okay. Here's the next one. We're here to bring you back to the one true faith, the Western branch of American Reformed Presbyterianism. You can't say the accent. That's just going to go. <laughs> I would have gotten it anyway, but that's a pretty good Reverend Lovejoy. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, count. that's good. He's he's funny, <laughs> and he you know speaking of the the, the staff kind of poking, they've they've got him down. I mean, it's, if Ned is the quintessential evangelical neighbor, Reverend Lovejoy is sort of your classic sort of half jaded, <laughs> you know, pastor who you, you're like, do I trust this guy or not? And you know, <laughs> he does weird things and says strange stuff. But yeah, that's that's good. <laughs> um. I was at Bible camp. I was learning how to be more judgmental. <laughs> That's got to be one of Ned's kids. Is it Rod or Todd? So close. So close. Very close. Maud Flanders. Oh, man. So I was in the right family. So he, Why was she at Bible camp? Oh, I guess a women's Bible camp or something? It sounded like a kid. Okay. That yeah, threw Bible me. Camp, but I was at least in the Flanders network there. All right. Um, yeah, so you owe us 10 seconds of advertising. So that uh, he's at, <laughs> Well, I had like a little stock there. Didn't you pull back? Yeah. Like, didn't I have 20 so seconds? You're at, you're, down at 20, you're at 20 now, I think, is the, okay. the net. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, if you're a really good person, but you're in a really bad fight and your leg gets gangrene and it has to be amputated, will it be waiting for you in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> So, so guess one more time. Deep theological question. If you're a really good person, but you're in a really, really bad fight and your leg gets gangrene and has to be amputated, will it be waiting for you in heaven? Golly. So guess and then we want your theological. Yeah, then you have to answer. Imagine you're, you're this is probably one of the characters in Sunday school asking the question, I'm guessing. I don't know. I could be wrong. Sounds like something like Mo Sislak would say. I I I don't I don't know. Who is that one? Bart Simpson. Bart Simpson. Oh, is that Bart? Yeah. Okay, there you go. All right, you're down to just 10 seconds of free. Man, it started well. <laughs> okay, uh, now if you'll excuse me, I have to appear on a tortilla in Mexico. Wait, he didn't, an he didn't answer the oh, theological sorry. question of yeah. Bart Simpson. Yeah, we want the question. Is your, is your leg... Do you get your leg back in heaven? <laughs> Actually, this is an interesting theological conversation, is the continuity between your earthly yeah. body and your heavenly body. Yeah, what form you know, do you take? Yeah, exactly. So am I, am I in heaven at 25, or am I heaven at when I, the age I die? Or do you if float? Was, do you need legs? Yeah, I mean, so the answer is we don't fully know. We do know there's there's enough continuity that you're the same person. And we also know that, at least in Jesus' case, there's enough continuity that he could actually point to the scars. Um, so we, we, but there's a, so there's we a lot there has, we, we don't know. He has one finger, at least. Heresy jar. <laughs> heresy jar. <laughs> oh, don't I owe something to the heresy jar? Yeah. <laughs> what did I say yesterday? Oh, I said, I asked God to magically bless the food. <laughs> Did you say magically? I said magically. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like tra transubstantiation. Are yeah. you asking it to change into something else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, so here's your next one. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to appear on a tortilla in Mexico. So I believe that's from the, the famous quote-unquote God episode. That's God speaking. So I'm not Nailed mistaken. it. Yeah. Nailed it, and also you have to put money in the heresy jar. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying God's going to appear on a tortilla. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so you, I didn't say I agreed with the theology of the Simpsons. Sure. I just said right, I enjoyed right. the Simpsons. It's fun. Don't get defensive. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, we're at 20 seconds now, I think. All right. I don't know if we should pray for our own enjoyment. That sounds like a sin. Oh, that's got to be Ned. Um, are we back to Ned? I'm going with Ned on that one. Wait. Who's that? It's Rod. Rod Flanders. Oh, because one, one, one of the kids. One of the kids. I should just be able to say Flanders family yeah. and just lump them <laughs> yeah, all together yeah. and get some credit. They all kind of. Am awesome. I really going to? Am I really going to pick between Rod and Todd? Yeah, you know, I think if you had said much. one of the kids, we would have. Accepted. By the way, the fact that the names rhyme is just perfect. Yeah, that's me. They, they have nailed. The, 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 there is somebody on the inside at the Simpsons that understands yeah. evangelicals in a frightening, accurate way. Talk. All right, is he at ten seconds now? 
I'm not, 10 seconds of average. 10 seconds. You got 10 seconds. Um, Ned, have you ever, have you considered any of the other major religions? They're all pretty much the same. I'm wondering if this is a conversation with Reverend Lovejoy again, because it sounds like Ned goes to him for a crisis and he gets that counsel. I'm going to go with Lovejoy on that. That's right. I think yeah, it was when he like calls him at 2 a.m. or something. And he's like, have you just <laughs> yeah. thought about? <laughs> I mean, Reverend Lovejoy, Ned is like his thorn on the side, man. He's always like, no, not again. Yeah, he, you take, he takes it away more seriously than he does. Oh, yeah. That, of course, that's the comedy, right? So you yeah. got the really devoted evangelical neighbor, but the pastor sort of jaded and not really that. He's sort of halfway into it. Uh, agree or disagree with Reverend Lovejoy's statement? <laughs> well, I disagree, obviously. That, um, and this is, this is you know, his pluralism, like Christianity is just one of many good choices. You know, he tells Ned basically to calm down, you know, don't, be, don't take it so seriously. He, he, you know, Reverend Lovejoy is a great mainline pastor, honestly. I mean, it fits, it fits perfectly. He probably liked my book, Progressive Christianity. So, uh, Could Jesus microwave a burrito so hot that he himself could not eat it? Obviously, a skeptic. Oh. Is the question stumping you, or to get to, or who said it stumping you? <laughs> <laughs> this is who said it stumping me. Um, you know, you, Bart was the one with the gangrene leg, but I, I don't know. That sounds like Homer to me. I'm going to go with Homer on that. Wow. Doing good. Yeah, amazing. got it. He's good. Okay. He's not lying. He watched The Simpsons. And oh, by the way, the, the, the burrito thing is just a, 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 a riff off that, you know, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it kind of thing or. Um, or Dwayne Johnson. Can no. he make the Dwayne Johnson big enough? That he can't lift him. Uh, right. Prayer has no place in public schools, just like facts have no place in organized religion. <laughs> <laughs> Agree or disagree? God, who said that? Say that one more time. Prayer has no place in public schools, just like facts have no place in organized religion. I wouldn't have got this one. It could be... Uh, uh, well, you've got uh, Seymour Skinner, who's the school principal. He wouldn't have said that, but the but the but the uh, superintendent Chalmers might have said wow, that. Wow! Amazing! Nailed it! Wow! That's Is that who said it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's great. I didn't even yeah. know that that guy was that name. Is he stealth googling these? This is crazy. Yeah, he's wow. even googling. That's amazing. <laughs> no, no googling. <laughs> That's not, like I hear the laughter keyboards in the back down of there. Your crew. <laughs> yeah. No, I. They love us. This probably is embarrassing how well I know this. Actually, I'm probably going <laughs> to you guys not to post this podcast. That's incredible. Should we just do a few more? Let's do a few more. Okay. If the Bible has taught us nothing else, and it hasn't, it's that girls should stick to girl sports, such as hot oil wrestling, foxy boxing, and such and such. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be Homer. Who else could it be? Oh gosh. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. Once something has been approved by the government, it's no longer immoral. <laughs> Trying to stump well, him. Ned wouldn't have said that. I'm trying to stump him because I don't want to do some hard ones. I don't want him to have a lot of advertising. <laughs> um, one more time. Once something has been approved by the government, it's no longer immoral. It may be Homer again, but it sounds like Reverend Lovejoy would have said that too. I... Pick one. Going with Reverend Lovejoy. Darryl, got, it. Guys, got it. Got it. Got more free advertising. Dude, I'm going to love this free advertising, man. I'm going to take you guys up on this. We're gonna oh, go. yeah. And advertise my own website. Which I will now change to the Simpsons. Um, let's do. Uh, let's do two more. Two more. Yeah. Uh, that's a Catholic thing, Marge. You might as well ask me to do a voodoo dance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you said it a little bit like Ned, so I'm going with Ned on that. He fooled you. I fooled you, Reverend Lovejoy. Fooled me. Was it Lovejoy? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Doc, that time. That just sounds too much like that character. Uh, the last, this is the last one. Lie, All right. Okay, last one. Lies make baby Jesus cry. Oh, I remember this. Dang it. I remember this episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to say Bart. I'm going to go with Bart on this. Mm. Rod Flanders. Yep. Rod Flanders. Yep. Was it Rod? Oh, yeah. that's right. You, you know why he was... I think he was playing a board game with Bart when he said it. Now that I remember, okay. Well, can't get them all. Hey, all right. How much? Uh, how much advertising does he have? Forty seconds. Forty seconds. Wow. Okay. Ugh. Are you ready for your free advertising? Okay. Get ready. Huh. Oh, hey Kyle, what are you looking on your laptop there? Oh, hey Ethan, I didn't see you there. I was looking at Michael J. Kruger's website. 
cannon fodder at michaeljkruger.com. This wonderful website explores the origins of the New Testament canon and other biblical and theological issues. How would you say it's improved your life? I'm glad you asked. I noticed it really upped your root beer pong game. That's correct. It improved my marriage. I no longer hate walnuts. And it's got plenty of tips for fighting chimpanzees. So check out michaeljkruger.com today. And enter the code BABYLONB, that's all caps, one word, for a fun surprise. <laughs> code may not actually work. We just made it up right now. All right, well, we're going to go to the subscriber portion now. <laughs> And we're just going to get a little casual conversation about canonization, maybe some other questions. We're going to ask you our 10 questions we ask every guest we have on the show. Thanks for being a good sport through this ridiculous episode of the Babylon <laughs> Bee Interview Show. No, this will be unique, for sure, for both of us. <laughs> Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. So you were like, God's not dead in real life. Well, I've seen the movie God's Not Dead. It wasn't quite that way, but... Uh... <laughs> Where do you even begin? studying canonization. Where, where do you even start with that? Have you ever heard of Mark Driscoll and do you like him? <laughs> <laughs> Have I heard of Mark Driscoll? Enjoying this hard-hitting interview? Become a Babylon Bee subscriber to hear the rest of this conversation. Go to babylonbee.com slash plans for full-length ad-free podcasts. Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee, 